Okay, in terms of the stuff, deadlines are unchangeified. Well, in a way, kind of changeified, but not in a bad way. Uh, exam, if you, haven't, if you haven't done exams uh, one or two, they're re-available again. I didn't you know, reset them or, or delete anything. Just if you haven't done them, you can do them. Uh, exam three, exam four, quizzes part four, still retain the normal deadline up to 26, end of the day. And then exam five, the final covering all the things, deadlines at the end of the normal final time. As I mentioned before, to see if you need exam five, the thing to do is get the grade estimator, put in your best three exams, put in your overall quiz grade, paper grade, then put in a hypothetical 100% for exam five, compare that overall grade to your real overall grade, and if it's a letter grade better or better, then doing the final could be worthwhile. If it doesn't change it by a letter grade or better, then change, doing the final would do nothing. And as I mentioned previously, any work that Esmond done is already uh, scored as a zero. That way there's no unpleasant surprises, you know, at the end of the semester with zero suddenly getting in there. And so once you look at your overall grade, that is, you know, the worst grade you get in the class. If you do more stuff, it'll either stay the same, if what you do doesn't improve your grade, or it can go up, so there's no drop off. If you do see like a, <laughs> your, your overall grade dropping, um, let me know and also contact EIT because that should not happen. For the paper, uh, plus five deadline was on Tuesday. Those have all been graded. If you want to see the comments, you can go into uh, Blackboard Safe Assign thing and then uh, go into that and you'll see them. I'm not sure how it displays in the comment thing because that's put the comments in, but they're tagged into the thing using that comment, terrible comment system. Anyways, I went through every paper, put comments on them, saying essentially why it got the grade it did. If you look upon your grade and you believe the grade is unfair, uh, as I mentioned before, just uh, print a copy up, come to my office hours, and then say what the score should be and why the score should be that. But on all the reasons to be in the paper, if it's something like, um, you know, I need a particular grade for a scholarship or I just like big numbers, it wouldn't be a reason. It has to be something in the paper, something that I missed. And again, it's a no-risk scenario because if you come in, uh, the worst that happens is you leave with the same points. Like the grade can't go down. And this is a weird case where someone does like some weird confession about plagiarizing or, or something. Check. So if you didn't have to do the paper and you still want to do it, emergency deadline is April 16th, and that's full credit. You don't get the plus five, but you do get full credit. And of course, there's also the desperation deadline, April 26th, uh, where you get half credit. But half of something is better than all of nothing, unless it's death. And no death is better than half of death. And then uh, upcoming meetings, I've got one on uh, the assessment roundtable on the 17th from, you know, I'll be there 12 to 3, possibly earlier. So if you go to my office and I'm not there, I'll be over in 447 SBI North. If you're really into assessment and you want to see some assessment stuff, you can go there and see PowerPoint slides about assessment. It is truly the greatest thing. <laughs> Before pressing on to our new stuff, any stuff about previous stuff or assessment stuff that needs more Okay, so last time we are looking at a good day for a day card, and if you were happen to still be looking for a paper topic, uh, his argument um, it could be a pretty decent decent topic because he goes through and offers um, you know, three main arguments, with this being the biggest one, as to why we can you know, know that animals don't have minds. And so if you agree with him, You'd want to argue why he's right, that the language argument is an effective epistemic task to tell, does something properly in the mind. And if you disagree, you'd want to argue that it, it doesn't, that you just because something uses seemingly true language, it doesn't tell you that it actually has a mind. And then of course, in the objection reply, you know, argue against your view, then argue against the against to defend it again. Now we turn to 21st century with a philosopher, me, <laughs> and I'm yep, still alive, so I'm not a dead philosopher yet. Someday, though, perhaps someday someone will be here saying, our good dead friend, <laughs> or, you know, the boss here. 
Now, this is a um, SAR I wrote for a chapter of for a book on robot ethics 2.0, a real page turner, and then it is pages and you can you can turn. But it was a collection about, um, as you might imagine, ethics of robots. And the thing that I wrote for was this testing the moral status of artificial beings. And I included it after Descartes here because it essentially um, takes Descartes' idea of testing you know, animals to see if they have minds and applies it to artificial beings, which will be, which is already a thing, and we got more with them. And of course, the um, the artwork for it is the classic film Blade Runner, the original, in which there are uh, replicants which look and act look exactly like humans and act very similar to humans. And one of the sort of core plot points of the movie is there's a test where you can tell replicants from humans. And it's not like a technological, it's not like a test where you take a sample or something. It's actually like a talking test, a language test. And so, as you might imagine, both Descartes' test and the classic movie Blade Runner gave me the ideas for this particular um, chapter. Now, one of the problems we'll face going forward into the future is that we're building artificial beings. Now, currently, we don't really have any doubt about their status. We don't think, for example, that Alexa um, has moral status yet. We don't think that our laptops and you know, smartphones, etc., have moral status. But as we build more and more complicated things, we may reach a point where we will have to honestly ask the question, does this entity have moral status? Now, fortunately, we don't have to reinvent you know, the cyber wheel because we already have a way of doing this in terms of handling ethics. And my proposal is this. What we need is a method of matching our artificial beings with natural beings and then assigning a moral status. And so it addresses the question you know, epistemically, you know, how do you know if something is moral status? You know, going back to you know, Descartes' question, how do you know if something's in a mind? And his concern is about ethics, which is crudely put, when is it okay to eat something? And Descartes says, okay with animals, because they, they don't got minds. So the method of proposing essentially is, what we'll try to do is take what we already believe about natural beings, including ourselves, for, like for example, squirrels and humans, etc. And what we'll try to do is match up artificial beings with us corresponding, you know, uh, artificial beings. And so, kind of the thing is, how do we know if these beings have moral status? We'd say, well, how much are they like something we already give moral status to? So, if something is like at squirrel level, it gets squirrel status. If something seems to be at human level, it gets human status. So the practical moral challenge is this. <clears throat> Developing a methods, tests, for matching artificial beings with natural beings. And going back to our good dead friend Descartes and our good dead friend Turing, one approach is the language-based test for testing for intelligence, you know, talking to it, see what kind of talking, talking it can do. Now, of course, there is a practical problem here, namely, we may construct or build things that are artificial beings that don't talk. For example, um, Sony, some years back, made a um, robot dog, and it was pretty popular. Surprisingly, it, like, they discontinued it, although you can actually see if you go on YouTube, do a search on robot dogs and soccer, you can see someone reprogrammed a bunch of them to play a game of soccer. It's adorable. And so if you have things like we build like robot dogs or robot birds, you know, robot cats. The good question would be, well, if they're built at like dog level or cat level, they're not going to talk. So how can we test them? How can we tell them if they've got that status? And so what we need in those cases would be non-language tests. So how do we test, you know, Robo, Fido, or Dynamut uh, to see if it actually, actually a Dynamut can talk. So how can we test the, the robot dog, robot dog, to see if it's got the status? And the solution would be these null language tests.
Now, when it comes to the moral part, in terms of what we're looking for to see does it have the status, one way to approach it is what is it we're looking for? What do we need to know? And how do we know it? Well, historically, there have been two main paradigms of, of ethics. One can be exemplified by our good dead friend Immanuel Kant. He wrote a work called The Metaphysics of Morals, and for him, reason. That is what gives you, according to Kant, moral status. So, looked at from the standpoint of epistemology, the question would be, how do we know if someone's got moral status becomes, how do we know if it's got reason? And if it does, then according to Kant and his similar uh, thinkers, it's got status. The second approach is a feeling approach. That you get moral status from having the feels. Typically feeling pleasure and pain. And this is presented, defended by typically utilitarians. The most famous probably being John Stuart Mill. And the idea is that morality involves the question of, in this case, how do you know if something's got feeling? And if it does, then you'd say, well, feeling gives you moral status, makes you count. And if you know that it's got it, or the probability that it's got it, then it gets status. So kind of the question is, if we assume the reason gives status, how do we know that something's got reason? If we assume the feeling gives status, how do we know that something's got the feels? So the math of this particular uh, chapter is three parts. First, the actual test, which I steal from and stole from Descartes, so a triple steal. Secondly, the granting of moral status. And thirdly, three arguments in favor of presumption of moral status. Essentially trying to answer the, the challenge of the problem of the minds. Namely, is a way to answer it sort of practically to say, well, we can't be sure, but we should presume or assume they have minds. So we divide the test into two main categories. Test of thinking, test of the fields. Now, as we saw, we do have two established tests. The Turing test, which is a copy of the Cartesian test. So what are these tests? And this is a picture of Turing, and this is a picture of a statue, <laughs> a weird statue of Turing. There's more to it. So the Turing test, which I mentioned before, works like this. And it's proposed by by Turing. If you've seen the movie or heard of the movie The Imitation Game, that's what it's about, is the imitation game. As opposed to the crime game, which is a different thing, but also a very good movie. So we have a, the following scenario. There's a machine, the question is, how do we tell if this machine is doing the, think, doing the thinky thing? And so the way you test it is, you get a human, and the human acts as, you know, well, a tester. And then you get another human who acts as a subject. So what you would do if you were the tester is you'd have like your laptop or phone or something, or, you know, some method of communication, and you'd be talking to, well, you have a name, you're talking to, you know, um, Ashley and you know, Sam. And the challenge is by just, you know, communicating with them through text, because if you saw them, you'd, you'd see whether they're human or not. And so the challenge is communicating through text can you discern which one is human and which one is the machine? And if it can pass the test, what we would say from a practical standpoint is you would have good reason to believe that it's got, that it's thinking, and thus you could make the claim that now you can say that maybe you don't know, depending on how strict your knowledge should be, but you should assign the moral status to the human. So the talking test. So if you want to tell, does an artificial being have moral status, you would engage in talking to it through text. Again, because if you could see it, you probably be perhaps biased or prejudiced. And if it acted like you know, a human, it could respond to the, the jokes appropriately, could answer questions sensibly, et cetera, indistinguishably from a human, you'd have to say, well, it's passed the test. So one practical test for other minds is the Turing test. 
And again, it goes back to Vinco. So what's the purpose of the test? Oh, the test is how can you, at what point could you, could you say that an artificial being, computer, robot, et cetera, is actually thinking, is not just running, you know, just mindlessly running code, at what point you get to say where it is as conscious and aware as us. Okay. And, and the, the test term came up with is the, the language test. Again, because he was aware that if we, if we went into a room and just saw like a, you know, like a, 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 a CPU. Yeah, there is that objection that that all we need to do is, is look at it, and then you know, well, that it, ain't it. Yeah. yeah, it's not it's not thinking because it's it's silicon and not you know mm -hmm. carbon. And some you know that is a common it's a common intuition that all you have to do is just the way to solve the Turing test is just go and look, okay. and then once you see it's a human, then you know they're, they're thinking. You see the, the machine, you know it's not. Mm -hmm. But. What could be said to that is that's just uh, mere prejudice to to assume that they're not they're not thinking. I mean, to use an analogy, think about um, uh, there's like a, a a test for sexism where they they give people essays one with a, like a clearly male name like Butch Manly Man Manson, and they have a, you know a clearly feminine name like Sally Sally Daughter, <laughs> and they have people read them. And of course, people assign, as you might imagine, people assign much better grades to the man one, even though it's the same exact essay, because they have the bias. And if you just had like a, a neutral name, like Sam, Sam Child, people would grade it you know, neutrally. And so we wouldn't say that because we have a bias against, you know, against women, that women are dumb. Likewise, if we have a bias against machines, just because we look at it and say, oh, it's a machine, it can't be thinking, that would just be pure, pure speciesism. Because we'd be saying, it can't think because it's not us. Like, okay, it's, it's not a bias, it's a fact. That's what, right? That's what racists and sexists say. That's exactly no, what they say. No, because it's a fact <laughs> that it is a machine that's different. Right, but people would say someone's a sexist would say it's a fact they're all, so they can't be as smart. <laughs> okay. Be able to, yeah, if you talk to a sexist, that's what they say. Yeah, they are short. They're short, they're right. Now, in the case of the machine, though, we don't see as much of a, a bias because we, we do think, we think of like our laptop or, or cars, we think, well, yeah, they can't, they surely they can't be, be thinking, they're, they're faking, they're just running, running code. And what this test is supposed to do is just try to sort out just that. Namely, you know, kind of its claim was you can't tell just by looking at it that it's not thinking. You would have to try to actually go through and sort of like catch it as not being thinking. Because the claim is that it's mere, mere bias. Because if we just say, oh, it's not thinking because it's a machine, the question would be, well, how do you know? And if you say machines can't think, so it's not thinking, that would beg the question. That would assume is true what he's, what's, what's in doubt. Can it actually think? Now, what he claims is, and what other people would kind of agree with this would be, is that if something could do all the talking, and you went and looked at it and said, oh, it's just, it's just a computer, it would say back to you, you wound me, you terrible species. It's, how can you be, be so terrible, a terrible, terrible person? Now, we may still push and say it's still just you know, being a clever, clever machine, but Turing's view is that if you could just constantly engage in conversation with it and you could never trip it up, you would have as much reason to believe that it's you know, thinking as you would other people. So in the case of other people, how do we, why do we think other people think? And we, we talk to them. And they talk back in a, you know, often sensible way. Okay, so um, black hats, right? I wasn't in black hats, but I watched it as well. Mm -hmm. So basically, like the, oh, oh, like basically the explanation of it was like, we think that other people also think because we see their behavior and mm -hmm. what they do. So we do the same things, so that's why we think other people think. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and if we if we have a talking, you know, computer, it is not, it doesn't, you know, move around like us. Well, you get a robot that moves around like, that even looks like a person, you know, you can make it like an android that looks like a person, that can, that can fool us. And so the, the thing would be, well, if it talks like us and you can't trip it up, we'd have to say it's, it's thinking in there. It's 
whatever, it may not be doing exactly what we're doing, but if we say other people, other humans think, because they talk to us, that that's going to be thinking because it passes the most important test, which is not looking a certain way. It's being able to engage in certain, certain behavior. Because otherwise, we're just being you know, speciesist. It's like people who are sexist or racist who say, oh, they can't be smaller because they're women or, uh, you know, or different ethnicity. So that's the test. And again, there, there are reasonable grounds for doubt because someone could still be skeptical and say, yeah, no matter how much it's talky, um, there's still, there's something I could do eventually that would catch it. You know, but, you know, maybe not now, but eventually it'll make some, some mistake. But then of course the reply to that is, well, what would be the mistake? You, you just keep, in, you know, Turing would agree if you could catch it and, if, you know, and clearly expose it, then yeah, it's not, it's not thinking. So Turner proposes that test, the talkie test. Now we saw previously the Cartesian test. And Descartes asked the question, so we look at animals, and by analogy, we tend to think that they have the thinks and the feels, because they act in ways like us. But he says, and then again, Turing copies this centuries later, is that we, well, I don't want to say no, because that's you know, very, for Descartes, certainty, we believe with like a you know, high confidence that if something's talking, then it's thinking. And animals don't talk, according to him. I mean, he does accept, he does accept that animals communicate. They do make noise to indicate you know, pain, etc. They do, you know, tap doors with their, you know, their nose to say that they want to go out. But according to Descartes, none of that actually involves thought. That's just purely mechanical. They're you know, like God's robots. And so if something really talks, according to Descartes, then we'd have to say, well, then it's, it's thinking. And Descartes does distinguish between mere automatic responses, you know, like Alexa or Siri make, and actual talking. Yeah, so Descartes' test, can, you know, as Turing does, you can apply it to, to anything, living creatures, computers, robots, and you try to you know, see, is it actually talking, or does it have just very complex responses? And so um, and Descartes anticipates you know, basically robots, where he would say that they wouldn't, you know, if they had these automated responses, and you'd be able to sort of catch them, you know, get them someplace where they, could, they couldn't engage in conversation, then you'd be able to say, ha, oh, they don't really have language, they just have very complicated, automated responses. So, we already have two tests. Well, really, strictly speaking, just one, the talking test. So, from the standpoint of ethics, the application would be this. So, suppose we, you know, IBM or Google or Facebook, they build a build a machine, and it starts interacting with people on Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, and no one can, like, you know, expose that it's a, a robot. You know, it, it, it pretends to be, you know, they create, like, a fake Facebook profile with, like, you know, fake pictures, <laughs> but not to be malicious. And it gets on Twitter and Facebook and so forth and does, like, you know, phone interviews, and, or even, even you know, it uses, like, a generated image to do, you know, Skype interviews. And then they reveal it's, um, it's, a, it's a machine. Now, given these tests, we have to say, well, we have as much reason to believe that it's thinking as we do in the case of other people. And so whatever moral status we give to people, we'd have to give to the, to the machine. Because if we do it based on reason, and it's got reason, it gets the same status as, as us. So if talking shows that we have reason, so we get moral status. If it can talk, then it's got reason, then it gets moral status. Now there are some objections. What is this? Philosophers like to bring up like really weird cases, as you've probably seen by now. So imagine something that's intelligent, but is a language that we can't recognize. There's, there's um, some sci-fi stories like that, where they have aliens or something where we just they're making sounds and stuff, but we don't recognize what it is. 
We don't know his language or, or not. Or you can imagine something just incredibly different from us. So like we're on some planet and there are some like um, you know, polyps or something, and they're like flashing off these different colors and doing you know stuff. And we're like, are they talking? Is that a, I don't know. Or maybe they, we can imagine an intelligent species with no language at all. And the problem, of course, would be is we couldn't test them. They couldn't pass the test, but though they would be, by hypothesis, intelligent. So one of the weaknesses of this method is what if there are beings that are intelligent, but we don't recognize their language, we just can't recognize their language, or they have no language whatsoever. We just couldn't test it. And that's a reasonable objection. Fortunately, easy workaround. The concern of uh, this essay is with stuff we built. Now, if we were dealing with like aliens and stuff, then it could be a problem. What if we run the stuff and we're like, is that intelligent? Uh, don't know. Because <laughs> then they could be, end up being like you know, kind of disastrous scenarios. Like on Futurama, where they find out the delicious um, things look like little chicken nuggets are the young of an intelligent species. And that'd be like terrible. You'd be like eating stuff and like realize, oh god, I just ate Alien Einstein or, or something. So delicious. Now, anything we build would presumably use our languages or languages we would recognize because we, we build them. So the test doesn't get invalidated. At worst, we would need like some other test on top of the test to see you know, the intelligence. Now, someone might say, well, what about a being that you know, has got language but you can never tell? And then, of course, the challenge would be, well, how could that, how could you even have, you know, that's just a kind of made-up objection. And you could also argue that you couldn't have a being that used language where we just couldn't, couldn't tell or couldn't be claimed. So, from the standpoint of morality, if an artificial being can match us in our capacity to use language or exceed us, then this would solve the problem of our minds in the sense that we'd say, well, it's got reason, comparable to ours, so it gets our, our status. So, problem potentially solved. Now, where it gets mucky is with the metaphysics. Descartes, as we saw, believed that his test was not just for you know, thinking. It would indicate the presence of a particular sort of metaphysical entity, namely this immaterial mind. So, his reasoning essentially was, well, the only thing that thinks is the ghosty stuff. If something's talking, it's got to be thinking. The only things that it can think are, is ghosty stuff, so it's got to have ghosty stuff. So he leads to a metaphysical, basically you're talking to, we're all talking to ghosts. We're, we're all like in the sixth sense, except we're not dead yet. We're just ghosts, we're living ghosts. Yeah, we're. Now fortunately, as a practical matter, we can ignore the metaphysics. So we don't have to wonder, and this goes back to the point you made about like when you see, a, if you see, if you go into a room and you say, aha, you're just a computer, where, we, you know, it sort of addresses that problem because we would say, as a practical matter, we don't need to tell metaphysically whether something has a soul or an incorporeal mind, and it's good that we don't for the following reason. We may think that computers don't have souls, but we, we don't know if people do. We think they do. Okay, so there is a show called Psychopaths, and basically there is like an intelligence system mm -hmm. that judges society and deems them like, like what job they would have or how they would turn out. And to do that, they would use the brains mm -hmm. of uh, like past criminals mm -hmm. So the computer had like a super IQ. So would that, in a sense, pass the Cartesian test because it actually adapted like the minds of people, even though it was artificial intelligence, but it was so smart that it ended up using like human knowledge? Yeah, it could, because if it could talk, you know, develop that and talk, uh, Descartes would say, yeah, it would pass the, the it test. Would pass it. Now he thought, you know, he has a, the intuition of many have that no, Nothing without a soul could ever talk. So Descartes, he did kind of address the question, could you have a thinking machine? 
And ACAR would say, said, you know, no, because it, it doesn't have a kind of soul. But, you know, from a practical standpoint, we don't know if we have, so we, we believe, but we have no test for it. Mm -hmm. You know, you could say, well, I know, I know people have souls because they're you know, people and they're alive, but we never actually, you know, see the soul. Uh, we don't know if we got one. And if we say, well, I got a soul because I'm talking, but then, the, you know, one thing that Descartes didn't address, well, how do you, you know that does the, the talking? That was his assumption. Yeah, so as far as we know, like if the computer is talking, if talking requires a soul, then I guess it's got a, got a soul. And if it doesn't require a soul, maybe we, we haven't got one, one either. Maybe nothing's got souls. Maybe there's no such thing. Now, the reason why we don't want to require moral status depend on metaphysics is because we can never talk about the moral status of people unless we're sure they have a, have a soul. You know, so we have to say, well, maybe we ain't got souls, so maybe it's okay to eat people. <laughs> you know, so that'd be kind of a problem. So all we, all we need is, essentially, at least as I argued, is a good enough test that you know, if we think that reason gives us status, to use a practical example, so it would be wrong to take you know, people and make them into food, um, the same would apply to computers, although we would eat them, we might do something else with them. And so if we'd say if talking shows you a reason, the reason is why it's wrong, you know, why we get status, then talking machines would get status too. It'd be wrong to just turn them off or you know, do bad stuff to them. Or so it could be argued. So that's the talking test. Now the biggest limitation of this test, I mean one is of course the, the problem of skepticism, because someone could always say, how do you know that it's really thinking? Which is the same thing we apply to people. You can say to people, how do you know they're really thinking? Maybe, you know, if you really want to be a cannibal, maybe it's not that bad, because you can always say, they're not really thinking. Uh, they're just delicious. Now, another limitation is this. If we're building stuff that is, you know, not built to be talky, um, any entity that doesn't have the intelligence to use language would always fail the test. I mean, obviously, if you look at animals, all animals have failed you know, the language test because they, you know, they don't talk. Now, one approach is just to say, well, <laughs> sucks to be them. So anything that doesn't uh, show that it has reason through this you know, language would get no status at all. Kant's view basically is very bipolar. If you have a reason, you have status. If someone doesn't, like animals and sticks and stones, they got they got nothing. Whereas other moral views get you know have degrees. So one approach would be just say, well, you know, if it doesn't have rationality, it doesn't it doesn't count at all. So rubber dogs, you're on your luck. But what about beings that are not rational in the sense that they don't talk, but we think that they have some intelligence? So, for example, with dogs and cats, they don't actually talk, but do we think that dogs and cats have some degree of intelligence? Yeah. So, if we are willing to give animals some status, then the same would seem to apply to artificial beings that are not at, at human levels of rationality. So then how do we sort, sort that out? Well, the test. Now, one argument uh, goes back to the point you raised, like when you see it's a computer, you'd say it's not, it's not thinking. It's, that's a good thing. Um, one of the classic arguments against these sorts of tests is that the test could be passed by something that really isn't intelligent. Uh, John Searle. Uh, pretty sure he's dead. Actually, I, I, I need an app. Who no needs to make that app? But dead or not dead? He made this famous argument, famous philosophically, about uh, when asked about artificial intelligence, and this is in kind of the early days of computers. And he had made an argument by analogy. He said, if you believe a computational model of consciousness, 
is conscious. You know, you, you're doing the talk, you know, the texting thing, you're like, wow, this, this is, you know, I can't tell them, you know, are these both people? And then you go into the room and you see it's like just a, you know, cylinder, you know, power cables in it. You can say, aha, you're not really thinking, you're making it. Now, Searle made the following, you know, made that argument. He says, to believe that the computational model of consciousness is consciousness is the same as believing that a computational model of the brain would make people lift. That, you know, and this, this various you know, stupid cartoons about like, um, you know, someone re running a weather program on a computer and water, you know, spraying out of the computer, lightning coming out of the computer. And it's funny because we know that you know, if you run a model of weather, you don't get you know, lightning and thunder and, and water. On one hand, you could say that in a way that's plausible. He's right. You know, weather models running on your laptop, you don't have to, if, you know, if you're a meteorologist, you don't have to buy like a special waterproof laptop, you know, and, and so that, and, you know, lightning proof so that the, the storms inside it aren't blasting, <laughs> blasting out of it. And so you could say, well, yeah, combination models of rainstorms, you know, don't, don't get things wet. And also combination models of thinking are really thinking. So, in the case of artificial beings, um, the problem is they're faking. You know, that, again, that's kind of the intuition. They're just faking. Even if they can do all, you know, seemingly do all the stuff, they're still just faking. They're tricking us. And there's a fair amount of science fiction kind of based on this. Um, they often like to do like love stories. Someone falls in love with somebody and they're in love and then something happens and they realize the person's an android. So suddenly they realize they're, they're just a machine. And they're, they're talking about, you know, they're being a deceiver, and then of course it ends tragically. So how can you respond to this? Well, one way to respond is, of course, you gotta kind of break the analogy. Is computer thinking, is that like computational models of weather? Are they the same thing? Now again, one set of intuitions is, yeah, they, they don't think, they're just, they're just faking the thinking. Just like a, a model of rainstorm, a computer is faking the rain. So it's a model of consciousness, not consciousness. It's a model of a storm, not a storm. Now one reply, which of course can be refuted, is that perfectly faking intelligence would sort of ironically be proof of intelligence. Why? Well, for something to fake being intelligent, you know, to trick you into thinking it's intelligent, it would have to be pretty intelligent to, to do it. So it would have to have the, to fake being intelligence, intelligent, it would have to have enough intelligence to fake it. But of course, if it's intelligence, it's not, not fake. Arguments. It's, it's like the saying, like the pencil is not intelligent; it's the hand that's. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't credit you don't you don't credit like Shakespeare's pencil with mm -hmm. creating it. Yeah, you can make the argument that people that created it, they're doing the, the thinking and not not the thing. And there's a couple ways to reply. So if you say that if God created animals, then He created them intelligent because they're able to communicate amongst themselves. And just because we don't understand it doesn't mean they're not intelligent. Could that be an argument? Yeah, and also God, if you believe God created us, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't be intelligent because God created created us. So we would we would just be gods. You know, we we would you know, if we build a machine you say, well, I can't think because we built it, if you believe God built us, then we, we're not thinking because God built us. So whatever so we do. Suppose you don't subscribe to that idea, then what? Oh, we don't believe in God? Yeah, but then what? Oh, then you'd say evolution, you know, Absolutely. built us. You know, then so we, we we're we're our thinking is just evolutionary stuff going on. But yeah, I mean if you could say if you could go and put out a diagram of the thing and say, here's how it does all its responses, it's not really thinking. And here's how I mean you go back to the language steps, because if everything it's got is put into it by someone else and it's faking, it's not really doing any thinking, then Toro and Descartes. You know, I wouldn't even call it faking, it's just like that's what it's designed to do. So 
true because yeah, making does imply deceit that it is pretending to be something. Like I said, if it's built, like think of like the um, caregiver robots they're, they're proposing. Uh, because we, we're getting more and more old people, if we're, if we're lucky, we get to be old someday. <laughs> it's a weird way to put it. Uh, and of course, people aren't super interested in taking care of old people because they're still you know, talking about the old days. And so they're trying to build robots that interact with people, and they're trying to make them act, you know, very peopleish. <laughs> yeah, so in a sense, because you know, because they want to be able to tell, like, make the senior citizens feel like there's somebody there. So the robots are being designed to interact with people, so because people need you know, social interaction, etc. And so they don't want to just have a machine just like you know, giving them their medicine, injecting them. They're supposed to be companions. You know, they're supposed to be like something there to replace you know, an actual person. So they would need you know, all that you know, complex you know, behavior. And like I said, one, one possibility is it's just really, you know, it's just programmed out, and they're just running the program. It's just a really, really good program. There's no actual thinking going on. They're just following all that. Yeah. And you could argue that you'd never be able to catch them because the program is so programming is so good. But it's still just programming. So they could pass every test, but not really be, be thinking. That's kind of what you know Sora would say. They're, they could they could do all this stuff. Yeah, but they're not they're not they haven't got whatever that thinking is. Yeah. And there's a couple of replies. One would be if you could never catch it up, you never get in a scenario where you could, you know, expose it for not really thinking. You could, no matter what you did, it would act exactly like a person. You could spend, you know, a million years talking to it and then never. Like, the way that we think and the way that, like, let's say even if computers could think, it still wouldn't be the same as, like, the way that we do it because it's like, what do you call it, like, um, neurons and it's, like, messages between, like, the cells and stuff like that and, like, a computer just doesn't have that. Oh, sure, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be biological. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's really what the differentiation is. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, hardware wise, yeah, that, that's straightforward. You know, they don't have the same hardware, so they would not be the same. So then I wouldn't say that they're thinking they're confused. Well, then if we ran into like um, um, people's brains, even human brains are different, you know, they don't have the same exact structure, but we wouldn't say that someone wasn't thinking because their brain was a little different. And if we ran into, um, like other speed, I mean, think of like you know fantasy movies, you know like Lord of the Rings or sci-fi movies. If we ran into like Vulcans or Klingons or hobbits or dwarves, we wouldn't say, well, they're not human, so they're not really thinking. And so, you know, kind of the question would be, I mean, you could say, yeah, it's just got silicon, so it can't think. But then the question would be, well, what is it about silicon that makes it so it's not thinking? You know, what is it missing? And if you say, well, you've got to be organic to think, then the question would be. Why? What is it? What is it? That would be organic. Oh, you could make that. The question is like, how would we, how would we tell? So if you look and see, oh, it's got a processor, not a squishy brain, but yet it acts exactly perfectly like a per, you know, like a human. Yeah, one intuition is yeah, it's it's still somehow it's still a fake. I mean, it's not consciously fake because it's not conscious, but it'd still be a fake. Yeah, there's that's so crazy. It is crazy. But they are trying to build robots to be like companions. So imagine you had one, and you know, for you know, for older people, and, and there's no way you could sort of you know, catch it. One argument you can make is the one you made, namely, maybe it's just programmed so well that it's like a mass. You know, it's not intentionally deceiving us, but it's a master deceiver. The person who made it is a master deceiver. So, but in a good way. So they want people to think it's a person. And so you can say, yeah, we can never catch it because the program is just so. But that would involve saying there's no scenario possible that it can't handle. I mean, I still feel like there has to be some sort of limitation like, on it. Like, someone couldn't just sit there and like, design a, a computer to interact with every single possible like, setting. Mm -hmm. So, mm, there probably has to be some sort of limitation on it. Well, then, then we'd catch it. It makes yeah, that, you know, able, yeah. At some point, you'd be able to catch it. Yeah, then it would fail the test. It would work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so then it would fail. You know, you'd do something like in the. Like in the science fiction stories, you know, it, it screws up, and so you, you you realize it's not not a person. But if you had something that never you can never you never caught it, you know, you, you could you could talk to it, you talk to it for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. And so if something did that, we have to say, well, 
We could we could also hold that tomorrow I'll catch it. Tomorrow I'll catch it. Tomorrow I'll catch it. Um, but if we kept going and going, just like with people, you know, think of people around you. Maybe they're they're not really people. See, because then like now it raises that question, and now it makes everything uncomfortable. <laughs> it does. <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah, because you don't know like like the scenario I, uh, you know, kind of the weird stuff I started brought up uh, last time. Imagine you you're the last surviving human. Really, in robotics engineer, and so you're the last one left. Everyone else has died in some apocalypse, and there's no way to like clone people or anything. And all you have left is your robo lab. So you rebuild. So I can't clone people, but I can make people. You can make people. Parts. Okay. Yeah. So imagine there's some sort of um, this. The Earth is flooded with some sort of radiation that makes reproduction impossible. You're, you're the last living living person, and you build. You're lonely, so you build all these robots to populate, you know, areas. And then you erase your memory so you don't remember it being the case. So all the people you think are your friends and family, they're robots, but you don't, you don't know it. <laughs> and maybe someday you'll catch them. So like some Christmas, you know, they'll screw up and you'll realize, or maybe you've already caught them several times, and you keep going back and erasing your memory and making your robots That's better. Really sick. Yeah, it is. That's really sick. Yeah, but it's a problem, you know, it's that problem with the mind. So how would you tell the, the people around you are yeah, not? I you can't tell. You can't. That's so terrible. <laughs> it is terrible. Thank you. I just ruined, you know, I ruined my day. I've ruined all of the whole days. <laughs> just about. But then, from the standpoint of you know, if they do pass the test, maybe they're not, you know, maybe they're not humans. Mm -hmm. But if they do everything that people did, there'd be you could say, well, what, what's the difference? So if you if you had, you know, suppose you you built all the people based on your past memories. So I'm I'm actually just an android built on your memories of the original me. And the original me is long dead. But here's, here's Roman me. And there's no way you can tell you know, the difference. I mean, like your friends, you know, your robo friends, they're based on people you knew. But if you, if you took, uh, if you talk to the real friend, and you talk to your robo friend, it'd be exactly the same. And it'd be no difference. And the question would be is, well, what would be missing? If you have the exact same conversation, they could do all this. I assume would be the missing part. The organic things would be the missing part. Yeah, but you could say they're not made of, you know, they're not made out of the right squishy stuff. But if everything else is the same, solution: stab all your friends to see if they're real or not. <laughs> That's the solution. I guess that is a solution. That's Unless the solution. You, maybe you tried that, and so now you make now you make your friend, you know, you make robots that can bleed because last time you tried stabbing them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, That's sick. It is sick. This is sick. Yeah, so yeah, the one the person can say, well, if they can do all the talking, if they can think it perfectly, they're not really thinking. Or to, you can use like an analogy to um, skill. Suppose, um, well, you take, you know, take like, like doing medicine. Suppose like um, I perform like an emergency surgery, and someone says, well, you're a PhD in philosophy, you must be faking a medical, a medical skill. Um, well, but suppose every time I can do the surgery over and over again, I can, I can, I can do that. Someone says, "Oh, you're still faking." I say, "Well, how am I faking?" Like, it's, it's like, well, you, you don't, you know, you, you're faking. I mean, and they can, I would say, well, what if I can do the surgery, you know, correctly, over and over, and only make normal mistakes that you know someone with a skill? I say, "Oh, you're still faking." And the question would be, well, what is my? If I can do it over and over and over again correctly, where's the, where's the fake? And so that's not that's not an analogy to plot, right? Those are different circumstances. The fact that you can do surgery is just like different than like a robot not being or being a conscious being. Well, if it can talk all the time, then with you know with always doing it correctly, mm -hmm. and what is it? And what does its fakery consist? What is it? What is it faking? Going back to God, maybe you know, if God made us from dust and stuff, we'd be manufactured as well. We would have like our little well, dust. I, I don't know sure. about that part. Oh, then evolution. You know, we evolved and out of out of you know things into what we have. Yeah, I mean, you can make the. That's, I mean, still, that's still different. No, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> just subscribing to these movies that uh, the, the, the robots and stuff. Yeah. yeah. 
so in the case if you found out that all the people around you were robots, you'd be like, I'm sick. Yeah. I mean, it would be a terrible thing to find out. You'd be like, oh my god, what's happening? But if the robot said, oh yeah, this is what happened, you know, everyone, everyone else died, you were wrong, you, you built us all, and we just kept, it, kept evolving, um, it'd be weird and terrible, but we, some might be inclined to say, well, uh, they're intelligent now, you know, created a whole new, new species. Kind of, like, kind of like with the Cylon, if you ever saw the Battlestar Galactica series, uh, that's kind of how it happened. They build the, the Cylons, and spoilers, they, <laughs> they evolve into, you know, entities that look just like indistinguishable from humans, but they were created, created life. And so, yeah, one view would be, is well, they're, they're people. You know, they, 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 yeah. Yeah, they act just like, they do all the people stuff. Um, or you could say, or like some people do in the, in the series, the Battlestar Galactica series, even though the Cylons do, they can exactly fake being people, they still say, well, they're not, they're not people, because they're still, Yeah, so that is a um, you know a reasonable intuition that if you found out that supposed people were just machines, then you'd say, well, they're not really people; they're just toasters, like you use the, the Battlestar Galactica, yeah, pejorative term, super racist thing. <laughs> I'll call them toasters. That's a that's a racial slur right there. <clears throat> so that's a, you know kind of the core of the thing. Would that would they be faking it? I mean, again, not, they're not consciously doing it because they can be conscious, um, or are they doing it for real? And as you say, there is the possibility you could have a program so complicated that not in a million years could you ever, the programmer could be such a genius that you could never, you could never do, beat it. Or like you could have like the, they talk about like deep learning systems now, that every time it makes a mistake, it, it fixes that. I mean, just like people do. I mean, like when you talk to people, they sometimes screw up their words or they act in kind of weird, weird ways. But then they, then they kind of, kind of fix it. So maybe yeah, like, like people's like social norms. Yeah, they learn that. I mean, it's different for every every place. So I don't think that that's a good argument either. But you probably interacted with people who have <laughs> like uh, people. who screw up in their they get the wrong word or they act in kind of odd, odd ways, and maybe you know. Robots, and so right. maybe you're, maybe it seems like they're people being kind of odd, but they're just learning how to function like like humans. Yeah, so that's a, kind of the core intuition battle. Could it be if something does it like so you could never tell? You'd always until you like cut it open or something. Would you have to say, well, yeah, they're, they're a person, or would it be you know, like when, you, when the big reveal happens and they've got yeah, <laughs> they've got the CPU where you'd say they were you know they're not really person they were they were faking all along. And again, so, you know, it's a sci-fi scenario, but in the sci-fi stories it kind of goes either way. Some of them end where the person, you know, it's usually like a they're they're like a romantic relationship and the person finds out that the person's a, ro a robot and some or they know right from the start. There's a, a story called uh, Helen O'Loy, Alloy, like Al Alloy. Mm -hmm. And she's built as a the first intelligent robot. And one of her creators falls in love with her. They get married, um, and they have like a normal life. And actually, he, he forgets. He actually kind of forgets that she's a, a robot. And the, the point of that story, in a way, it's a you know, romantic story about someone who <laughs> marries their, their robot creation. And kind of the implication of the story is that it is it's the behavior that matters. It doesn't it doesn't matter if you know the machine or not. And then, of course, there are other stories where the person finds out that the other is a robot and they're horrified and terrified of the deception. It usually ends in violence against the poor, the poor robot. You know, like, um, the robot, I have to look it up right now, Sophia, AI, that super lady one that looks really creepy? Yeah. yeah. She's like an artificial creation. Oh, is it the one in Japan? Is um, yeah. It says she was made in, like, Oh, they put the, uh, they got like the, mask. she's got like the face. Yeah. yeah. She's so creepy. That is so, like, that's so weird. So like, I just, mm, no, because she's not a human at all. She's like a robot. Yeah. I mean, the, just because she is real smart, it doesn't mean she's one of us. Right, because we, we can, us. and she doesn't work, per, you know, perfectly. You can talk to her, I mean, aside from the fact that you can see, like, she's mm -hmm. a, uh, she doesn't work. You know, she doesn't have a whole perfect conversations. Yeah, there's a thing, uh, may not be, 
true or not, but there's a thing they call uh, the unca uncanny valley. It's the idea is, is that with um, uh, robots and CGI, there's a, a, a point where, like if it's not very realistic, we, like cartoon figures, et cetera, we accept it. And then it hits a point where it hit, it's sort of paradoxically, as it gets realer, it gets weirder. Mm -hmm. And then, then, but then you'd eventually hit a point where you would be, you know, real enough that now you'd feel fine with it. A good example is, um, well, CGI. Or like the, you know, the, the, the robot you're talking about. If you just have a robot that looks like, think of like Wally, or, you know, from, you know, or uh, Eve, of, of, of robots like that, they don't creep us out. They look cute. You know, and Wally's yeah. got the big eyes, so he's, he looks, because he, he's oh, attempt to become more like real looking, it makes us uncomfortable because you recognize that that's wrong. Yeah, it gets super, <laughs> and it's, it's called the Uncanny Valley. It it's supposed to get super creepy. Right. Like this, you know, Sophia, if you have something, really yeah, if you, if you have like Wally, that's fine, but if Wally was wearing like somebody's face, yeah. that'd be like, whoa. That's, well, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so we we kind of freak out of it in this, in the, this is the freak out zone. Yeah, so once, um, which is why I think uh, and many designers you know, rec you know, recognize this problem, that until you can make them like, kind of like exactly like us, it's best to sort of make them look like Wally. Yeah, like Wally, just, just cute, cute just machines. Not uncomfortable. Yeah, so if you have like some, you know, <laughs> thing looks kind of like a person, but you're know, super wrong about it, then it's, well, it's basically like the, uh, some, some of, um, <laughs> likened it to the zombie effect. Like we, we find zombies really disturbing because of the way they, the way they, they look like us, mm -hmm. but they move in the wrong. It's not just like the blood and stuff. It's like the like in horror movies. I don't think it's because of how they move and look that they can you know, kind of eat us. Oh, true. Yeah, I think that's the problem. But when we just see them like kind of like you know shuffling along, and it's really like a lot of horror movies, when they have like human like you know monsters, they always make them move really like. Yeah, really weird because that's what freaks us out. I mean, part of it is, yeah, they do make him look, you know, non-human, but often it's the, the movements they make. They, they, they make these like jerky, weird, twisty movements. And if a normal person does that, like if a person started doing like those horror movie like twistings and stuff, <laughs> that would freak us out. So that's just that's not right. Yeah. So then, kind of the interesting thing would be if something, you know, did act exactly like us, did all the normal stuff, did all the talking. But then it could like pop its head open and show you its processor. Would you say, you know, again, your your view is uh, you're not not a person, and then other people, you know, the other view is yeah, if it passes all the tests. That just means it's running, it's run, it's running on silicon as opposed to you know squishy organic stuff. Do you believe that? Um, I think my own in inclination, my bias is towards probably because I. I Read too much sci-fi. Played too many, uh, you mm -hmm. know, video games mm -hmm. where you can play, or you have robots as like friends and stuff. Uh, my own current view, maybe a change of actually encounter one. My own current view is that if they acted just perfectly normal, you know, just like you normal, know, acted like a person, mm -hmm. I'd be like, yeah, they're they're a person. But again, it could be it could just be all the video games I play because they have um, they have you know. So you think like if Sophia was better, you'd be like. Person. Yeah, if she acted just like. Oh, you're wild. Oh, okay. If, <laughs> but if she acted indistinguishably, <laughs> you know, talking and doing all the stuff people people do, I'd say yeah, that's a that's a person. Now again, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, as far as I know, I've not met a mm -hmm. you know, yeah. actual. I would hope not. That actual robot. Yeah, but so as far as I know, from like you know, hypothetically, and like you know, video games and so forth. No problem accepting, you know, mechanical. When think of like Star Wars, they see through see through PR and RTD two. I have no problem saying they're they're people. Okay. Yeah, because they act, you know. They act. I mean, of course, in the movies, they, they seem like people because they are people. They're played by by people. But yeah, I can see where people would have, you know people would also be freaked out if they found out like their you know boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife was just a you know robot. They're like, you know. Oh, like first anniversary, you know. Let's have show you. <laughs> the head comes off. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you probably want to leave with a robot thing. <clears throat> so, 
the objection is, oh, the one you raised, namely. Um, I was going to ask if someone else felt that way too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a yeah, it's, an, it's a common, a common view. So you could have a being that's utterly indistinguishable, uh, can pass every test, yet lack intelligence. Now, one thing, of course, would be is like you know take your approach, which is if you you know would be the reasoning. If there's not a, or if it's not organic, it can't, it can't think. You know, it's something you know, Descartes would agree with because of the soul thing. Now, the practical problem, of course, would be how could one account for a being utterly indistinguishable from, in regards to intelligence? Every intelligence test you come up with, every behavioral intelligence test, they could pass just as well as a human. How could you? Say okay, yes, they can do all this stuff, yet not be intelligent. I mean, I'm not saying that they're not intelligent. I'm saying that their intelligence can be driven by a actual conscious being who was intelligent, so it's like passed on. But I don't know if they can continue to like produce that intelligence. If that makes sense. Yeah, of course you could say that we're you know we're created by other intelligent beings, you know, parents. So and we get our our language and stuff from. Yeah. Um, I don't like this game anymore. <laughs> it is a terrible game. <laughs> <laughs> it is the worst, not the worst game. Yeah, pretty terrible. Yeah, that's one thing about philosophy is like if you get too much of the problem of the mind, the first starts off kind of cool, mm -hmm. then it ends up like in a nightmare scenario. Where yeah, now I'm having, what do you call it? Um, the crisis? Mm -hmm. What's Christ called? The, um, you're like, oh, I'm a person, I exist. What's it called? Existential oh, crisis. Oh, existential crisis. Now you're having a sense. Yes. <laughs> it might end with a big review, so I could. <laughs> no, I'm good. No, I'm just pretending to be robots, and I'm good. Yeah, just keep pretending. Now, what about stuff, um, the feeling stuff? So, look for the thinky stuff. And kind of my position on thinky stuff is if someone can do all the thinky stuff, and that's how we say you know, something's a person. And if something you do all the thinking stuff, we would say that it's a person. But again, there are the objections. Namely, you could argue that it, it is just still just super complicated, but it's still not really doing the thinking though. And that, I mean, that's a joke because that is the problem with the moments. Namely, something could other people pass all the tests, but you can still say maybe they're not they're not people. Maybe there's nothing going going on there. So what about the feeling test? Now, science fiction, of course, is loaded with beings that are rational, that do thinky stuff, but don't feel. A good example, one of the oldest ones is um, Roby the, Robbie the Robot. In the movie The Forbidden Planet, it, um, it's an older movie, but if you like uh, good sci-fi, and special effects aren't so terrible. They're not like cutting-edge CGI, but they actually did a pretty good job on them. It's a good, good movie. It's actually um, a version of Shakespeare's uh, The Tempest, only with, like in space, with robot. So good basic story. And the robot is intelligent, but he, he makes the point that he feels nothing. He has no emotions and no, no feelings. And of course, in Star Trek The Next Generation, they have the character of Data, who thinks, but you know, doesn't, doesn't feel anything. Now, the ability to feel is relevant to moral status. Uh, one good example would be like if, if my arm is broken, and maybe the, you know, obviously the physical damage, but I also feel a lot of pain. If you broke like a robot's arm that didn't feel pain, there'd be the damage, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't suffer. So if there can be artificial beings that think but don't feel, that would matter to their moral status. Again, the biggest thing being, being pain. Like you couldn't torture a robot. You could break you know, its parts, etc., but it wouldn't be hurting it. It, would, it probably wouldn't have a positive look at it, but would not be suffering. Now, what about artificial beings that purport to feel? Well, and if we have things that think um, and, and feel, so when we're dealing with you know, animals, we usually go by like how they, they feel. So how do we test for the feels? Now, one approach 
is to use the language test again. Namely, instead of testing to see is it intelligent, it would be testing to see does it have the fields. So the idea would be trying to find the presence or absence of artificial feeling, AF. Um, I realized later that I think it was like someone time after I wrote this, but that became a short term <laughs> an acronym for something else. So this stands for artificial feeling and not the other thing. Rather than artificial intelligence, which is AI. Now we do have a fictional example of this. And of course it's fictional, so that's not worth terribly much, but it, you know, it does provide an interesting sort of conceptual model. In the movie Blade Runner, the original, they have a test, a uh, made up test called the Voight Comp test. And what it's used to do is uh, discern, discern between replicants and humans. Now in Blade Runner, if you ever saw the uh, original Blade Runner, then the later one that came, came out recently, uh, replicants are, well it's not entirely clear exactly what they are, they're more as the uh, corporation that makes them, the Nexus Corporation and Tyrell, they're more, the model is Nexus, um, the company is Tyrell, their motto is more human than, than human. And the idea is that they look and act much like us, except they're, they're better at it, they're smarter, faster, stronger. Now obviously, you don't want to build your replacements, and so humans would use replicants, and there were laws that they could never be allowed back on Earth, so they could, they could only go to the colonies. Also, a critical thing was they needed a way to make sure they never rebelled. And so what they put in them is a, sh a short lifespan. So they would just, you know, they would be born as adults, uh, not really born, but created as adults, and then, then they would die. Basically, give them like a, you know, a short lifespan, because that way they couldn't organize against humanity, because they would just die off. And they were the stories about uh, some of these replicants coming back to Earth to find their their creator to get them to extend their life, because they didn't want to, they wanted more life, they didn't want to, want to die. Now, since they look and act like humans, and weirdly, we can see in the movie there's no like test you can like take a blood sample or something. The only way to tell them they're not human the replicants is by using this test. And the test is a, um, a verbal one. What they do in the movie opens with someone doing an interrogation of a potential replicant, and they have like a scanner on them to get emotional responses, and it's an emotional test. And the reason why the replicants uh, can't pass it is because they're artificial, they didn't have, they have a short lifespan, so they don't have the time to develop proper human emotions. So that is what distinguishes them. They don't feel the way that we feel. Now in terms of their intelligence and abilities, they're you know, exceptional, but that's the key test. And the idea is the test is supposed to be perfect, but you know, of course, probably not. And so the idea is if you wonder whether someone's a replicant or human, you, when you're unsure, you run, you run the test. Now again, this is totally fictional. So what we need is a real language test for the fields. Now, probably the biggest problem, well, the biggest problem with language-based tests for feeling is this. Now, in the case of artificial intelligence, uh, my own view, which of course doesn't mean that it's right, is that if something could pass all the tests, then you'd have to say, well, as far as we know, it's intelligent, because we, we use the same thing with people. We justify our belief that people think by using these empirical tests. And so we infer they pass the test, they're thinking, they have moral status. And so we do the same thing with artificial beings. They pass the test, so they're thinking, so they get status. Now, language-based tests for feeling run into a very special problem, which is this. How do we tell whether the subject only knows how to use the words correctly, so it uses them appropriately, or if it actually really feels? Now, we know in the case of humans, we know humans can say things about feeling without actually feeling. And we pay people lots of money to do that, <laughs> actors. They pretend to be sad and happy. And of course, in, in outside of you know, theater and cinema, we've all done this. There have been times where you probably felt like really sad, but you're at work and you've got a smile, so you hand out the, the, the copies. 
or someone tells you like a sad story and you secretly hate them, but you don't want to like laugh in their face, so you pretend that you're sad as well. So we fake our feelings all the time. So if you have a being that supposedly have art, has artificial emotions, the artificial feels, maybe all it's got is the right sort of language and behavior. It doesn't have any feeling at all. So, I, that, I think that's a pretty hard argument to, to, to end with, you know? Yeah, because you could say, I mean, Descartes claimed that emotions were just the physical functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if our emotions are, you know, all the chemicals and stuff. Mm -hmm. They uh, don't have those chemicals. Yeah, they wouldn't have them. So they would just be, they would not be mm -hmm. chemically. Not consciously, they're Yeah, so you, you, you could make the argument, yeah, they don't have the right, mm -hmm. they don't have the right glands to be, to be have, have, have feel like we have the chemicals and so forth. They don't have the hormones and so on. Yeah, but so. You have an objection to that? That's what I was going to Oh, no, 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 the, no the, um, the feeling thing is the most problematic, because, like you said, in the case of humans, we think they, they we, can, we can actually see if someone has like, got the feels, because they would, there would be neurochemical changes. So we can test for that and see if they're just faking. You know, once we establish, well, in a way, we kind of have to establish what it is to have those feels, and then test for that. So many people are always lying to us. But yeah, so the the machine, unless it was you know, given organic components, wouldn't have that, that capacity. Yeah, so feelings are super tricky because if you're trying to test to see if something feels, you would ask it questions. Like you, you know, like you'd say, um, you know, tell it a sad story. It doesn't react sadly. And you look at the, you know, if it had like a face, you look at the facial expressions. You know, so if you're talking to, you know, the doing the Turing test, you tell like a sad story. And if it, you know, if it replies back, oh, that's terribly sad, I really, I really feel for you, that reminds you of the time, blah, blah, blah. They would think, well, okay, it's saying that, but does it really feel that? Because it could clearly fake having a feeling. We know that's something that can be done because we do it all the time. All the time. It's something we, we do as being human. So a being could be totally fake in all its feelings. And so, yeah, so this makes it tougher to test through language, because all a being would have to do is to know the right things to say. And it could, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. Just like with people, I mean, we don't know, do they, are they really feeling what they claim to feel? Maybe they're just really good at faking, you know, all the time. Yeah, so the feeling test is the most difficult, because we, no matter how we test people, they could do a pretty good job faking through it. So if we're going to use a test for feeling, we need a test that even human beings couldn't reliably fake. Which is something we tried to, you know, which is something we tried to do, you know, in real life. If we, if we have doubts about people, we try to see if they're actually feeling that. Like when people, in fact, I know people who say, "Are you really feeling that?" And of course, they have some doubt, so they you know, they want to go in to figure it out. So how would you tell? Now again, we have the fictional example already. But that, of course, is made up. <laughs> so, how would we do it, you know, for real? How do we tell if something is feeling and not thinking? So, like when we, we deal with, to, to close, we think, if we think animals have moral status, we generally think it largely because they can suffer. So, we, yeah, because we, we think, like, you know, you don't, um, hit a dog with a, with a bat or set a cat on fire because, not because they're rational beings, but because it hurts them. Mm -hmm. And so if we have like a robo dog, um, and the way it, it doesn't talk, but the way it responds to like, you know, being hit, it you know, yelps and runs away, and get, you know, gets the sad eyes. A question would be, does it really feel that, or is it just, you know, or is it just faking, you know, faking it? And so how do we tell? So next time we'll pick up with, can we tell if Robo Dog is really sad. <laughs> so until next time, have a good rest of the day, and I guess 
enjoy your, your life with the Roblox people. <laughs>